So much talk over crypto tax, but what does it really mean for India's crypto investor, the young crypto community of India? Also, is there a difference between a CBDC and a cryptocurrency? All that and a lot more. I'm your host, Ayush Alavadi. We'll be decoding crypto for you on this episode of Tech Today. And to get a sense of what that crypto tax announcement is all about, how will this actually play out and what are the concerns of the crypto community, the young crypto investors that everyone keeps talking about here in India? Well, we've got a stellar lineup of guests, Badri, Harshal, Anush and Parin. It's good to have all of you all in our work from anywhere lives, all under one roof here on Tech Today. Badri, I'd like to start off by asking you the crypto tax. Now, we've had all the news channels and news shows talking about this crypto tax. If you could simplify it for us, and because you understand not just tax, the law, you're a student of the law, and of course you understand the tech world as well. So given the nature of what cryptocurrency is like, and the blockchain and the decentralization, can there really be a tax, or is there a way for the tax man to really bring the crypto investors into the tax net in theory and in practice? Thanks, uh, Ayush. I think like you said, uh, you kind of put the boomerang right at me. Um, somebody who kind of loves tech, tax and law, you know, this cryptocurrency and, uh, you know, this entire tax on it uh, is very interesting at some level amusing uh, for us to see, right? So we were talking at one level about whether to ban cryptocurrency or to keep it. And before you know, you've got a taxation on cryptocurrency. At a very simple level, what the government is trying to do is that they want to impose a 30% flat tax on uh, cryptocurrency. The only expenditure they want to give is the purchase price of the cryptocurrency that you're going to be either selling or exchanging. So it's not just the sale, even the exchange or any transfer of one cryptocurrency to another is going to be uh, taxed. And then there are, of course, tedious provisions to kind of figure out who's selling and who's buying. And then, of course, they've got a very wide definition of what a virtual currency, what they call as a virtual digital asset. So in sum and substance, they're trying to tax this entire area, uh, which is cryptocurrency. But I think it's, like I said, some, at some level, as a tech person, I find this amusing. It's more like taxing spirituality, okay? You can tax the palmist and the sadhu, but the real people who are like on the edges of tech, okay, it's going to be almost impossible uh, to be able to cover them. But that's what it is, right? So this is how uh, they have thought about it. I think it's a place where they want to start from. This is not the end of what we are going to uh, be with. Uh, so this is like, you know, baby steps into trying to figure out that we can tax an area. And I think the thought process is that the retail investors, the ones who are investing every day, they are trying to kind of protect them at some level by saying that we'll impose this tax and protect you uh, in this. So it's, it's a discouraging move for a retail investor to have to pay high amount of tax uh, mm -hmm. on, on this. But I don't know how the institutional investors or those who work across different borders uh, are going to really operate out of it. But that's my two cents uh, uh, on no. this tax. Pareen, I want to come to you since Badri brought up a very valid point, something that I've been listening to a lot on social media and somehow it's not made it to the mainstream media. This whole distinction between retail investors and institutional investors and these numbers which the regulator seems to talk about and then the government says something and then on social media exchanges say something else, the young crypto investors, this very cryptic term of millions that exist apparently in India, how many of these, according to you and your, you, you've worked with the exchanges in the past and of course you understand the tech behind it really well. How many of them, if you were to ascertain, I know it's a tough one, but how many of them are actually using these exchanges, complying with KYC and how much of that money is really in the global markets and from India with the institutional investors, the big boys really, who are investing in other markets or even looking at other ways of really parking their money outside of the tax net. I think you've raised a really relevant point here. Uh, when we say young Indian millennial investor, that's mostly retail traders. Uh, of course, the numbers are really high. Uh, we know that uh, they are in millions and uh, these are young folks who are trading, but the ticket size per individual is really low. When we look at uh, large ticket sizes, traders who are actually running funds on top of it or who are doing some kind of serious margin trading on these markets, because the markets are global, they need frictionless uh, on-ramps and off-ramps, right? Which doesn't happen very well in India as of now. Uh, if someone was doing a serious fund in India, 
you just couldn't convert from INR to Bitcoin, Ethereum, USDT that easily uh, if the volume was really, really high and you couldn't afford to do that. So most of the institutional investors, uh, I would say, are trading in the global markets directly. Also, India has a premium. Uh, there is a there is a price differential when you look at Bitcoin's price or a USDT price mm-hmm. in India. Ideally, you don't want to deal with that. So institutional investors are actually probably already trading in global markets. Uh, retail investors, yes, of course, uh, they don't mind this, and uh, they are they have been trading in the Indian markets. How do you really view this? Is this thirty percent tax that Badri was talking about that sent shockwaves across the cryptoverse? Is it that bit too much when it comes to being a deterrent? Because largely when you're looking at these big companies or even the startups that that you work with, what's the sense that you're getting uh, from your conversation, Harsha? Overall, it's um, extremely positive. India's flirted with the ban for so long. The fact that they're coming out and wanting to tax it actually legitimizes cryptocurrencies as 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 an investable asset. There's some what we call FUD around um, the whole India crypto scene. You know, we, um, you know, I've I've been uh, fortunate enough to be an early investor in in CoinDCX, and and this has been a hindrance uh, in their growth throughout their lifespan. But now, um, you know, government coming in and, you know, wanting to regulate, uh, it's it's a definite step in the right direction. It is bittersweet. 30% is quite high, especially removing any kind of short-term, long-term uh, differential, differential. It uh, incentivizes more folks to actually hold their cryptocurrencies rather than exchange um, or, or you know, kind of realize their gain. Mm-hmm. And it also kind of indicates that this is step one. Uh, we'll see these different kinds of tax reformations come about slowly over time. And, and similar in the US, see what happens when you're purchasing through a centralized exchange and then you're bringing your currency into a decentralized wallet very hard to track and um and in fact in the us it, it's a lot of self-reporting how are you going to really mandate that and in fact you're seeing large crypto investors starting to relocate into areas like puerto rico that mm. have different tax laws and then they'll redomicile so we'll see those types of issues kind of arise at the same time it's a huge huge deal and it's it's a positive step and there's no denying that when crypto enthusiasts have have added to this narrative of the tax coming before the regulation, does it legitimize cryptocurrency or this larger crypto universe in India? Is this a way of the government acknowledging that cryptocurrencies exist and we will need to learn how to live with them? Do you think that there is some sort of sanction that, that or some sort of legitimacy that they've gotten post this announcement? So first and foremost, you know, just by taxing this does not give it legitimacy because as you know, we also tax black money. Okay, that does not mean it's legitimate, right? So we also have other uh, instruments that we tax which are not considered as legal. Smuggling, for example, under customs law. Okay, but what Harshu was saying, the fact that there is a recognition today that there is a large number of people who are trading in these assets and these assets per se are not bad okay uh, where their real concern is that the retail investor should not get short change in the entire process and the government having to come and uh, rescue them uh, at one level i think uh, the cbdc for all its worth which is like a digital currency of india i think that gives it a little bit more legitimacy uh, with respect to uh, to this but just because they have taxed it at least in the eyes of the indian regulator may not treat it mm-hmm. but if you look at the overall scheme of what they're trying to do there is something where there's a recognition that just outright ban uh, on this uh, will not be done. like i said i don't think this is the last word on this mm-hmm. and i agree with Herschel that 30% is a very high rate of tax. Anush, I want to get your take on it. Given the decentralized nature of blockchain and crypto, how difficult is it going to be for the Indian government to tax and then regulate crypto? Sure, um, Ayush, let's uh, let's really break this down. Um, how, how the technology works is instead of banks maintaining ledgers where transactions are recorded, for example, if I were to send you money, a bank would deduct 100 rupees from my account and add 100 to yours. Now it's just a bunch of computers all over the world which are doing essentially the same thing. Now banks being regulated entities and obviously being licensed by the central bank, there is a lot of supervision. You know, There's a lot of visibility in it when it comes to what transactions are being undertaken. All banks undertake KYCs. But when it comes to being able to transact just based on the internet with anybody in the world at you know at a 
fraction of a cost at uh, multiple times, you know, at a fraction of the, uh, the time as well, you can literally be transacting with anyone just by having an alpha, alpha numerical key of characters, which is basically a private wallet. The amount of visibility the government has is very minimal. Um, compliance will stem from self-compliance, number one. Number two will, will stem from all of the marketplaces, all of the facilitators, all of the centralized service providers who are providing on-ramps and off-ramps to uh, to anybody who's getting who's becoming part of this ecosystem. Um, in, a, in a number of countries, most regulators have sought cryptocurrency exchanges as the gatekeepers because they are the ones who actually record data of all of the customers who are coming into this space. So to a large extent, it is the centralized bodies which will help the government. But apart from that, as you mentioned, there are a lot of folks who believe in the idea of decentralization, who believe that currency should not be controlled by the sovereign, but they, it, they'd rather have it controlled by a bunch of computers because you know you can really uh, rely on computers to uh, to feed algorithms, to, to process algorithms. So those folks can choose not to disclose. It's very easy not to disclose, but obviously at some stage, regulators will start criminalizing non-disclosures because they want full visibility. And that's where you know there will be a true battle of um, whether you whether you can really live in a fully decentralized system without the control or the oversight of the government, or you have to sort of marry the two and still live in, in harmony to some extent. And also it's, it's crazy guys that we've been living in this work from anywhere world in the past couple of years. So we're all really relishing the prospect of perhaps living somewhere else and then flying back to India as much as we love it over here. Parin, is this really compelling a lot of bright young minds from India to find more favorable places to set up and continue working in the crypto sphere? I think the larger debate uh, here has become around trading. Whether trading will be allowed, whether people will book losses or profits or capital gains and stuff like that. Uh, actually, the larger game that is to be understood here is that countries are competing with each other for talent now. Uh, we know that Web3 is much larger than crypto. And crypto is just an asset. Uh, what Web3 enables is much larger. And this is where a company that is $10, $15 billion worth is being built in two years, three years, uh, compared to Web2 where these companies used to be built in 10 years. Right? And for the first time, there are Indian founders who are selling their products in the West instead of just Western companies, Western software giants coming to India and selling their products. Uh, this is a unique opportunity for India. And if we just take an example of uh, something like Portugal, they've just abolished uh, tax on crypto gains. Uh, even if we look at closer to home Singapore, uh, Singapore has given a 11% tax slab for crypto gains. Uh, the reason these countries are doing this is because they know that we need to be competitive on a global stage to attract this talent that you said is very mobile. It's not just work from home now. It's just everything has become so uh, conducive for people to move and for businesses to be registered. Uh, what Balaji said last year is that you know there will be there will be a time when a person is staying somewhere, their company is registered somewhere, their employer is somewhere. There'll be five jurisdictions that they will be connected to, and we are we are moving towards that kind of a world. When this happens. Uh, I don't want India to lose its edge. Uh, this is our chance to shine and attract global talent. Why can't we make the Silicon Valley come to Bangalore instead of have our founders go there and become the Sundar Pichai? Right? Guys, I really appreciate that you joined us on Tech Today and discuss these elements of crypto which haven't necessarily been covered in the media before. This was a fascinating conversation and we really appreciate you guys for taking time out and joining us on Tech Today. And we appreciate that you were tuned in for this first segment, but there's a lot more. This, of course, was a conversation on the crypto tax and what's happening in the cryptoverse, but there's a confusion amongst a lot of people on social media and, of course, in the crypto community about how how this CBDC will work and how different it is, if at all, from cryptocurrencies. That and a lot more on the other side. of Cryptocurrency, conundrum, confusion, and now there's CBDC. Welcome back to Tech Today, guys. There's a lot of C's and a lot of confusion, but the newest C to the list, especially after the union budget, is all the talk about a CBDC or a central bank digital currency. What's it all about? Is it any different from cryptocurrencies? Well, Tech Today has all the answers in the next story. 
Well, there's been a lot of confusion about crypto and CBDC over the last week and I'm here to break that down for you. What is CBDC? CBDC is basically central bank digital currency. It's basically legal tender issued by the central bank like the RBI. It's exactly like your traditional currency except in a digital form. So like your fiat money, your cash bills, your coins or even checks now are considered as CBDC. So you can use CBDC to purchase goods and services and even other kinds of transactions. It's basically the traditional way of transacting except this is in a digital form. It's just like having 1000 rupees in physical cash except here the cash is in your wallet on the app which is installed on your iPhone or your Android device. Well, thinking about it, CBDCs are very similar to your cryptocurrencies. They both need a digital wallet to store, to manage and to conveniently use your funds. And both of them use the same underlying tech blockchain. And both of them are called digital or virtual currencies. But that said, CBDC is not like your typical cryptocurrency like Bitcoin. Firstly, let's talk decentralization. Cryptocurrency like Bitcoin or even Ethereum are not governed by a central authority. So no banks and no government. On the other hand, India's CBDCs is governed and distributed by the RBI, which means its management and regulation of this currency falls under the government of India. The RBI is also in charge of setting the limit and its distribution, of course, that also gives them full responsibility to produce more digital coins in case there is a need to increase its supply. Cryptos usually have a finite supply. For instance, Bitcoin has a supply capped at 21 million BTC. And since BTC does not have a central authority, it is decentralized, no one can really change its maximum count. Well, unless the protocols are modified, which hasn't happened so far. Crypto is often looked at as a store of value which you can buy and sell on cryptocurrency exchanges. Whereas CBDC is your typical currency which you can use just like cash but it is a digital alternative. And you can only get that from the Central Bank of India, the RBI. While both CBDC and cryptocurrencies work in similar ways in terms of tech, they have different uses when looked at from the perspective of finance and policy angle. Welcome to the part of the show where we get all your tech queries answered and let's start off with the first one coming in from Aryaman Bhagat. Aryaman asks, saying when Josh Waddle sold his five letter word game to NYT, the New York Times, after that, will New York Times charge for that particular game? Now, we asked these questions a while ago when Microsoft did the Activision deal and over there, there was a clarity saying that we won't pull out our earlier titles on the Sony PlayStation Store. But here, this is a much more simple game and a simple acquisition. I think it's nearly a million dollar acquisition. Josh Waddle, the guy who came up with Wordle, the word game, which everyone seems to love now and you see all of it all over social media. Well, it seems that for now in the statement issued by him and the company, that Wordle will continue to be free. Now, I think Aryaman's concern stems from the fact that New York Times might put this behind a paywall. But Josh Waddle, the founder of the five letter word game, which is quite elementary, but has given us a lot of joy during the pandemic. I'm guessing a lot of you all played and want to keep your streaks and wins, all of them intact. Well, he has given some sort of reassurance in this tweet. He's actually said at the end of his statement that when the game moves to the New York Times site, it will be free to play for everyone. And I am working with them to make sure your wins and streaks will be preserved. So if you have to go by what he says, at least for now, it seems like it's free and we hope that there are more games like this which actually were born in the pandemic. It was a pandemic baby. He actually invented this game to play with his partner. Simple five letter game that brought, like I said, a lot of us a lot of joy and we hope it continues to bring us that unbridled joy for free. The next question is a relevant one. It is a tech budget one. So I'm glad you all were tuned into the budget on India today and you are also asking tech related questions. It comes from Ayushi Modi. Ayushi asks, as announced in Budget 22-23 about e-passports in India, what changes are likely to be seen from the prior one? I'm guessing you're talking about the user experience. What we understand is there will be a microchip embedded in these e-passports. They'll be printed in Nasik. That's what Tech Today has learned about these e-passports. But I think the user experience, Ayushi, becomes a lot 
more hassle free and secure. I'll tell you why the long queues you have at the airport when your passport is being verified will be reduced and cut down. Think about it, the e-passport could be scanned in a matter of minutes as opposed to the physical verification nowadays at the immigration counter. That takes hours sometimes and those lines are long and serpentine. That could be avoided and that could get better. It'll also help really sort this whole fake passport business as scammers would find it very hard to actually mess around with the data recorded on the microchip. So in 2022-23, we Indians will have e-passports and we're all looking forward to that. Of course, we had all your tech queries answered here on Tech Today and you can always reach out to us on our social media handles at Business Today and you can even write to me on Twitter, Facebook, Instagram and the like. But if you're following us on our social media handles then you'll know that India Today and Business Today actually put up the first Facebook audio live as a publisher partner on Facebook, this new feature where you can essentially have rooms like podcasts or clubhouse rooms or Twitter spaces and in this group huddle well we got together with the crypto community to actually discuss some of the things we did in the panel as well. So we have our ears to the ground and we are listening when you are chatting about crypto and that's how we're getting some fantastic inputs on this show tech today as well. So stay tuned not only to this show on TV but also to all of our social media handles because we'll be covering this space on India Today, on Business Today and of course on Tech Today. Thanks so much for watching. Until next time, adios.